the very rules of eating, of negativity and singularity, including the ultimate form of singularity, which is the whole state of things, a pure violence without object anymore. This is the typical violence of Violence because what happens there is the murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. For Baudrillard, the fetishism becomes purely ideological when fetishism becomes purely ideological when it becomes this perfectly smooth, self-enclosed system, this self-referential system. Right. He, he talks about it as like a, a mirage that negates its, that negates its appearance as mirage. Yes. Right? So a mirage right. that pass, perfectly passes itself off as, yes. as the real. Right. I, um, fuck, I think there's even a quote in here. Yeah, here it is. Economics miraculously succeeds in masking the real structure of power by reversing the terms of its definition, while power consists in unilateral giving of life in particular, a contrary interpretation has been successfully imposed. Power would consist in a unilateral taking and appropriation. Under cover of this ingenious retraction, real symbolic domination can continue to do as it will, since all the efforts of those under this domination will rush into the trap of taking back power from what it has taken from them even taking power themselves, thus blindly pushing on along the lines of their domination. In fact, labor, wages, power, and revolution must all be read against the grain. Although, yeah, I don't that's not a hundred percent. No, I mean, I mean I but that's better. I think that's the you know, it, since it's gonna happen, we should just get it out of the way right now. We should go ahead and talk about the fucking matrix with with <laughs> uh, even though this isn't the chapter on simulation, he he's already He's already kind of forewarning us, and I would just say that, I mean, without really getting into the particulars of the film, right, the, the glitch in the Matrix is that the little, I don't know, you know, Lacan That's when the call, real pokes through, right? it feels right. like. Right, that's when the, or when the mirage shows, it, shows itself. Shows, yeah, yeah, shows, like shows COVID, its, for example, I think is a good example. Well, that's of interesting. How, yeah. Well, go further, what, what do you mean by that? Um, well, it just exposes the – I mean, it removes the veil of – the government is completely ineffective. Reason, everything is ineffective against the simulation or the unconscious, right? You see this with the COVID, the anti-vax kind of – the anti-masking, the anti-vax stuff. Right. right. I mean, how can you possibly imagine any kind of coherent political project being – working – that's a, a universalist project that's going to work for a politics of a, of a country the size of the United States. I, it just doesn't seem possible without extreme repression. You know, what, what's, what's fascinating about COVID is it's not, first of all, this isn't the first time we as humans have, right. have encountered a, uh, a virus of this type, you know. But I was just thinking about how you didn't necessarily have the same type of if there were anti-vax voices back in the 40s or in the 80s or in the 70s and 80s, they obviously weren't they were limited any credence. By, yeah, they, were, they, were, they weren't given any credence because otherwise we'd still have smallpox, we'd still have polio, shit like that, right? Yeah. I mean, the fact that we were able to, I say we, I mean really the global community, not just global community, however you you ideate that. You know, we were able to, I think in, I think it was 1980, so it would have been, you know, worked on in the 60s and 70s to eradicate smallpox, you know, which is why, like, in some dark room, in some lab, you know, if smallpox is being, like, housed, you know, it could be, although we'd still have vaccines for it, but, but, uh, but then if you go back, it was biologically used in terms of warfare against right. the Native Americans and shit like that, I mean, those kind of atrocities. But the other thing, specifically more like with Baudrillard, you know, I mean, a virus is literally a code, right? He, he right. asked yes. this question in the preface about, about how do you fight DNA? How does he put it? He says, uh, can we fight DNA? Certainly not by means of the class struggle. I mean, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. I think that that's like, on the one hand, that's obviously part of Baudrillard's black humor. 
I think he's I think he's got more dark humor than oh yeah D and G or Leotar. Oh I think, for sure. I think Leotar's humor is more deranged. I think yeah. Deleuze and Guattari's. I don't even know if you call it black humor. Um, right. At least, well, you might call it black humor in the way that Deleuze defines it as you know um, allowing contradictions to subsist side by side without canceling out. Um, in a kind of non-Hegelian way, but you know, I think with Baudrillard, I do think that he uh, he is the darkest of the you know of the three amigos. If we if we think about anti Oedipus, liberal economy, and now symbolic exchange and death, this uh, this trilogy of works that we've right. been th- we've been talking about, I do think Baudrillard's darkest. Uh, yeah. But in any case, yeah. So viruses they are codes, and and, and what are weird about viruses is that. They straddle, and Simon Nunn talks about this brilliantly. They, I won't go into that, but yeah, they straddle uh, the real and sim. Well, well, they, you could say you could say that, but for, I mean, for Simon Nunn, they straddle the 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 purely physiological or the, the purely physical. Okay, yeah, and yeah. the biological. They're not they're not themselves inherently in and of themselves alive. They're not in and of themselves biological yet they are able to uh, replicate Reproduce, themselves right. by way of uh, very, much like capital. <laughs> very much well, like it's, capital it's, is virus. Yeah, right? they extract a surplus value that allows them to replicate their physical yeah, yeah. structures. And it has devastating real effects for oh, biological yeah. entities, even though they aren't themselves inherently biological. Ooh, that's very paradoxical, very uh, counterintuitive thing. Because it's, I mean, if you think about the, the, the different kingdoms of life, you know, animals and bacteria and protists, blah, 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 fungi. I mean, viruses aren't included. They're kind of, they have one foot in the biological world and uh, one foot out. And that's what makes them particularly, um, well, obviously the fact that we don't, we can't see them with the naked eye, blah, 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 right? Right. You know, know what's interesting is the type of, I guess, typically what's, you can kind of see the death drive, life drive contradiction within the virus because mm-hmm. the virus cannot be – there's an upper limit in terms of its virulence um, or in ter- uh, oftentimes like ob- obviously besides certain – like there's going to be those outlier viruses, Ebola, right, that are just like devastating. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, if you're looking at a bell curve, the majority of viruses are not going to be lethal – on a hundred percent basis, right? Well, the rhino because virus, they must right? a fucking cold. They have right? to reproduce. They can't kill off humanity entirely, right? There's got there has to be, a, I guess, that surplus, right? There's got to be a surplus left over right. for them to reproduce the system of their own, whatever of their That's own code, etc. Right. This is why you were saying it, it's analogical to capital. Right. Injecting, it's almost injecting its own code. It's injecting its own code into the biological and using the hijacking biology for its own ends. That's right. right? So yeah, it's very, it's a very apt. And and I think, I think you're right to say there's like a bell curve because for the most part, you're right. They are more like symbiotes than, 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 because there is a logic of the parasite whereby the parasite kills itself by killing its host. You're right. And yeah. or the and, spider and the frog metaphor too is another good one in a sense, right? Tell me, tell me this, tell me this metaphor. Well, like the frog, the there's a frog and a and a scorpion. They're going to cross a river. Oh, this. Oh, you said spider. Oh, sorry, okay, gotcha. my bad. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I but, but, scor- no, for for the audience, go ahead and finish the. I've seen the the meme. But. So yeah, the frog is. He agrees to carry the scorpion across on his back across the the river, but halfway if if he promises not to sting him, but halfway across the river, the scorpion stings him and they both drown. Right. Yeah. Because the scorpion can't. Uh, right. It is what it swim. is. It cannot. But it also is locked into its drive. Right. It has no choice, in, but to do what it to be what it is. Yeah. In a sense. Yeah, it's a it's a stinging machine, but yeah, I do think that this this is good to start with the way um, Baudrillard uses the the notion of code. I'm sure that as we get deeper into the book, it will become more apparent. But you you see this in his earlier writings too, where he the way he uses code seems to be very similar to 
how Saussure defines language or how Saussure sense, def yeah. defines signification negatively. Right. right. This is this is why he starts off the first chapter by saying, well, beyond the beyond the haunt the symbolic haunting modern social institutions, which is of course, you know, Marx and Engels, the specter of communism haunting. Where is it? He he talks about it doesn't really matter. He talks about this this move from from a signifier to signified relationship, right? We've talked about this a little bit in Saussure, the, the, you know, the diagram that he always draws is the word tree, and then there's the bar, and then there's the picture of the tree, right? The, the signifier and signified relationship, which for Baudrillard is, is one about exchange. And he's saying that as we move further and further in as history accelerates, whatever you want to say, capitalism accelerates, there is a move that Baudrillard locates that, that is the other side of Saussure's definition of language, which are signifiers are only, only signify insofar as they are different from other signifiers, right? So it's all it's this negative definition. And so it becomes less a question of signifier exchanging for a signified and more about relations between Yes. signifiers amongst themselves. And this is why Baudrillard starts to talk about this floating system of signs that are merely oppositional. And for him, I would say this is one of the rudiments. This is one of the elements of the shorthand he uses of code. I think when he says code, he's thinking of this, uh, this kind of slippery system where it's no longer about reference, right? It's no, the, the tree image, doesn't matter anymore. It's now tree versus rhizome versus root versus whatever. It's always, for him, it's just this play of signifiers. And this is why he says a uh, referential value is annihilated, giving the structural play of value the upper hand. I think, right. I think that's kind of what he means when he yes. says code, if I had to guess. Because I'm not fully clear, but I think that that's what he means is this loss of the referent. And I'm not yeah. sure, sometimes I feel Baudrillard Ex exhibits a bit of nostalgia for this lost right. referential uh, yes. system. And yeah. yet at the other times, I feel like he's kind of like, good, fuck it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hard, it's hard to say. I think right. he kind of... Yeah, he I does. He, he plays <laughs> both registers. That. I think he plays both registers right. to a certain benefit. Yeah. And I think here he's, you know, this is earlier in, in his writing. I think he definitely gets a lot more cynical yeah okay well, his work and this we haven't seen the worst yet <laughs> yeah oh yeah this is this is him as it at his most sit uh systematic in terms of writing maybe uh, that, that perhaps is not fair to the first two or three books he published because he's but at that point he's still in his more marxian sort of structural marxism i think almost this is where like the little he really takes a much bigger leap from marx and I think even yeah. is kind of stepping out of the shadow of Bart as well, yeah. a little and, to a degree. He has a he says something either in this book or in the for a critique of the political economy of the sign. He 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 talks a little bit of shit about Bordeaux. Yeah, right? we we mentioned the. I hope we did. Did we did we talk about? Did we record and and well to refresh the the listener? Coop and I were discussing that. Baudrillard had a powerhouse of a yeah. I mean, I've mentioned this on the, I've mentioned it on the pod before, but I can't. It's been a while. So Roland Bart, Henri Lefebvre, and Pierre Bourdieu. So with Roland Bart, he gets this semiological interest. This is why he starts with Saussure. He takes kind of as a given that we are in this kind of post-structuralist era where. Yeah where the play of signifier and signified is no longer ascendant. It's, it's almost like a bygone artifact. I think that like, it would obviously still function in certain registers. I think that for, for Baudrillard, it's just a question of precedence. Yeah. yeah right? It's yeah. just a question of which has become dominant. Right. And so like when he says the referential value is lost, I think he means that it's just, it's, it's antiquated. Right. Yeah. It's just, not that it doesn't exist entirely. There's still, it's a process that is intensifying or has been intensifying it's pretty incredible right. i think that he's able to spot this trend in 70 you know right the book that came out in 76 i believe yeah i did 76 and so i mean obviously i think anti Oedipus goes a long way to like you talked about the trilogy of the 68 sort of books being yes 
anti-Oedipus, libidinal economy, and, and symbolic exchange and death. I had jokingly posted that if we looked at these as, as Star Wars films, it works, per, it works out fairly well that I think anti-Oedipus is like a new hope, I think, in, in terms of its, what it's doing and its sort of positive spin on things, or if there's a praxis or something, right? I wouldn't say positivist, but yes, positive, yeah. Positive, pro- <laughs> yeah, like there's a, po- there's a project, there's, there's possibility, et cetera. And then libidinal economy does make a lot of sense as empire strikes back, in a sense. Things but look their bleakest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then symbolic exchange and death is not really Return of the Jedi. <laughs> no, not, not quite. It's no. more like, I would say, it's pr- if, if we had to use the Star Wars films metaphor, it's more like Rogue One, where everybody dies at the end. There you go. Yeah, you got to have the, I mean, their death is The treated. sacrifice, right? The yeah. gift. The gift to the fledgling rebellion. Which is ironic because at the end of Rogue One, we know the last scene is the beginning of A New Hope, right? So right. Yeah. it all cycles back. Yeah, I like that. I, I don't know necessarily. I like the metaphor because you're right. I don't think that symbolic exchange of death is Return of the Jedi. But I do think it's funny that in we don't know that Darth Vader, we should have, but we, I mean, in retrospect, we do. But we don't know that he's Luke's father definitively right. until uh, until um, Empire Strikes Back. So yeah, anti, anti-daddy, Dadapus. <laughs> I would say that one thing I want to look forward to, we talked a little bit about how Cicero's structuralist vision of language is underpinning. And that's going to come into play big time. And right. I'm actually glad, I think you and I, I'm glad to have on the final cha- chapter six, is where the Cicero stuff really gets nitty gritty with the poetics Okay. And whatnot. So I'm like, I'm so glad that I have you this time because that felt last time I did the book on a different podcast. It was, that was like the part that I didn't, I struggled with the most. You had something about the gold standard, but I will say that like losing, losing uh, the, the sure footedness in a signifier signified relationship in the exchange value of signif- signification, as he says, that is kind of like losing a gold standard. I think this is right. why he talks about these signs as floating. Yes. Because all you have anchoring them is, I mean, really. I mean, it's like currency trading too. It's like there's yeah. no, right? Everything floats against the dollar, et cetera. Everything floats within the internal logic of the system there. It doesn't refer to any sort of right outside uh, transcendental value. Yeah. And this is why I think he uses the, the even though he doesn't bring up Derrida's by name, he he talks about the difference of death, right? This, this difference that's, there's nothing to anchor signs down in their play. What's interesting too, he doesn't do it in this first chapter, but in his essay on fetishism and ideology, his main kind of Derridian point is that when we, when we reduce the floating of the code down to binary oppositions, we almost always, in general, come back to a hierarchization of yeah. one over the other. This is very basic Derrida 101. Right. This is logocentrism, and mm-hmm. and this is where he starts to see the play of ideology and and sort of well, like his his cynicism about sexual liberation, for example, where he basically says it just more firmly ensconces each sex in their own domain of. Right of opposition. Uh, yeah, or, or you know, or I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 privilege it, terms. Since since we didn't read that for today, I don't want to go too much into it, but I just think that you see some of this still. I think with his point being about how power still functions through the code and how the code um, kind of dominates and and how in the end it can't merely be. His, I think his main point, what the the one the one place where I want to push back and where I see Leotard pushing back a little bit is, you know, Leotard just to boil down without going over all the libidinal economy again. His main point against Baudrillard is that symbolic exchange, in the end, do the play of intensities, blah blah blah. It is political economy, which is not something that Baudrillard wants to argue here. Here, I think Baudrillard wants to say political economy is the referential mode of signification. It is signifier has it signified, everything's anchored down. We're cool, we're good, there's equivalence. 
And I think for Baudrillard, this is why he proposes the notion of ambivalence, which obviously has psychoanalytic overtones, right? Freud talks about ambivalence all the time, specifically in terms of constitutive bisexuality, that we're like with the Wolfman, the, you know, the Wolfman plays the young boy in the Oedipus complex who wants to kill his father on the one hand, but he also plays as a girl who wants to be the sexual love object of the father. So there's obviously this ambivalence in every relation. And Baudrillard wants to say that the, the realm of the code today is ambivalence, that there is no, there's no longer equivalence anymore as the dominant mode of exchange. And therefore we're outside of political economy because for him, Political economy is this regime of equivalence. Without it, we can't really understand the dialectic of production and consumption that Marx sets out, first chapter of the Green Risa or, or wherever. Uh, now, Leotar wants to push back on that, and I think that that's fascinating. And that's, that's a thread we'll have to keep pulling at. Yeah. I just want to kind of throw that out there. But I think that for Baudrillard, one of the things that, again, this is part of his cynicism or it's part of his radicalism even if we are outside of political economy per se or at least if it's not the dominant mode for ana for analyzing power relations for analyzing what the how the code is ascendant mm -hmm. then that means revolution in the classical sense is no longer operative right is it, for him it's just a myth yeah and you know later it makes a lot of sense i mean right like how much we'll how much resonance does this have in terms of <laughs> what Fisher is getting at in terms of capitalist oh. realism, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, that's kind of a further development of this sort of, of this sort of movement overall. I think later Leotard, not much later, but later Leotard would agree with him, even if in the liberal economy, he gives Baudrillard a hard time. Yeah. Which I think is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, yeah. Even though he says that we're brothers and we like agree with him on some points, but for example, he'll want to call out, Baudrillard's racism, which I think is funny, but it's not that it's not Baudrillard himself that's called racist. It's it's how he's, well, for example, how he fetishizes the immigrants class in this first chapter as as being what he calls the analyst between the working class and the bosses. I don't know. I don't really want to touch that. I just think it's funny that Leotard just casually throws that out there. I do think that. The Baudrillard has a point, though, because, you know, Badu's very good about this when he talks about, and here, when, what Badu focuses on is the, the question of undocumented workers, right? That, you know, obviously the right wing way to say it would be illegal aliens, but that's kind of overcharged. It's this question of individuals who are included in the system, but don't belong to it, right? So they don't have they don't have the functions of citizenship in all of the different matters that count. And yet they are still a necessary yeah, ingredient yeah. to the working of the, of of the system. system. Yeah. Yeah. If you're thinking of another point, um, I just wanted to go back to, I didn't answer your question earlier that great about COVID and how it exposed a lot of this, but I think really what it did just to be brief is that it, it exposed the really life and death, how class, relates to life and death in capital in the way in a stark fashion in a way that it's not been experienced in a long time i think since perhaps the vietnam war would probably be the most recent event where class divisions were so tied to life at the immediacy of life and death in such a stark way that everyone it where it's like on a on a broad scale where everyone is aware of it not just these sort of forgotten corners of capitalism where this horror horror goes on right even now we have this situation with the workers at a plant in kansas and it's someone died on the it's a frito lays factory and someone died on the assembly line making okay. you know, chips etc the workers removed the dead body and the line never stopped they just dragged the person out and they were replaced on the line and the whole operation did not slow or, or stop etc right so and this has happened in in other assembly lines, but I didn't know that. Oh, I'm sure. Right, this right. Time. Yeah, this and is now, a, and, this and is a the, recent thing, but that's not a new variation of the horrendous production work conditions of capital. Obviously, is no news to anyone, especially historically speaking. COVID is a very much, in a sense, like the real poking in. And I don't know if that's necessarily from the Baudrillardian conception of the real, which we can go into later, but... I just wanted to kind of sort of say that it crystallizes social relations of capitalism and how that notion that Baudrillard brings up about 
how the capitalist gives the worker the the gift of life, right? Yeah, the this gift is of, a- of a deferred death, right? Instead, okay, instead of instead of get, getting your death all all up at one time in a in a re- very quick succession, we're gonna let you die slowly. Two things. I thought that towards the end of the chapter, he unpacks the etymology of of the word slave. He traces it back to Latin servus, right, which is where we get the word serv- servant, service. And he brings up Hegel and obviously the very famous analysis in the phenomenal, phenomenology of spirit where it's the Lord bondsman or the master slave is usually what is called the master slave dialectic, right? And there's a lot that could be said about this, but I think it's interesting instead of Baudrillard kind of turns it on his head or sets it on his feet, however you want to look at it, because, you know, obviously in Hegel, it is this question of the stake of the subject, the stakes for the subject to gain recognition in consciousness is a struggle to the death, basically wagering life, putting life on the line. And then what Baudrillard shows is like, initially, if we quote unquote primitively, prisoners of war were put to death. This was like the honorable thing to do. Right. And then he somehow sees this as the origin, whether or not that's true anthropologically, ethnographically, we'll just leave aside. I think it's interesting that he takes that as the first way to deal with prisoners of war, that that's, I mean, we could see this either in rites of cannibalism or even in Bataille in terms of expenditure with, with the, all the different sacrifices, right? This generally did happen in some societies with the prisoners taken, the warriors taken. And there was something honorable in this. But Baudrillard shows that the next stage is to take slaves, right? And the warriors weren't the only ones taking the slaves, the, the women and children too. It's a function of population too and a function of ancillary labor. And so from that, he talks about power as death deferred. I thought that that was interesting. Yeah. Right, the and power. that's kind of what I was getting at yeah. too, right? It's, I have the ability as the capitalist to give you, I can defer your death. Yes. Yeah, and, and that's that's the interesting thing, I think. that I give that, you purpose. I give you the means to reproduce your existence. Almost like they're potlatch in a sense, right? It's Jeff Bezos or et cetera, like those level of characters, right? They have such wealth that their, their giving of labor is... Yeah, he says, whoever works has not been put to death. He has refused this honor. Yeah. So it's interesting to think about that it's not, as he says, it's not the power over life and death, which is how we normally... Yes. We see, it like, uh, that's kind of the definition of the, the pater familias, right? The, the father, the head of the household in, in Roman law, which he had the power over life and death. He had the power to take life away. And I think that for Baudrillard, it's interesting. The it's the inversion that he emphasizes here that power is is deferring death, the power to defer death. Yes, that's kind of a fascinating thing. And it seems to, because I wanted to come back to another point you made, but it seems to tie into his intimation, his very subtle, another nuance he he brings out, which is that. The capitalist is not giving a gift of wages, that it's labor or labor power that is giving the gift. This is the bottom of page 62 where he says, if through labor the exploited attempts to give his life to the exploiter, the latter wards off this restitution by means of wages. So we just said that power is death deferred and it's like the worker's like, no, take my life. And the explorer is like, okay, but in exchange, I'll give you back wages, which is kind of, again, deferring death. And then he says, um, here again, we must take a symbolic radiograph. Contrary to all appearances and experience, capital buys its labor power from the worker and extorts surplus labor. Instead, capital gives labor to the worker. It is the capitalist who gives, who has the initiative of the gift, which secures him, as in every social order, a preeminence and a power far beyond the economic. The refusal of labor in its radical form is the refusal of the symbolic domination and the humiliation of being bestowed upon. 
and goes on. But he, but he basically says wages symbolically buy back the domination exercised by capital through the gift of labor. So I kind of had it wrong. It's not that labor is giving surplus value, it's that the capitalist is giving the exploited labor as a gift. Right. That's how he that's that's how he sees and he's, and he's basically saying that this is not something that can be reversed or this is something that only in its reversal can we like shake the system because the wages are means of, if you will, what's a good way undermining the uh, the radical gift of death. We're trying to give our death here. Take it, you know, like immediate violent death here take it and that death is deferred and turned into a slow non-intense death through uh through wages that's kind of his his basic argument and he has he has other ways of saying but i thought that that was one of the most one, one of the more interesting things and it accords with his with this whole purview about the you know going back to marcel mouse and looking at his notion of gift and counter gift societies and that for him we don't live in a society where we can pay back where we can give back where, where counter gifts are systematically structurally right uh, represented foreclosed right yeah something too along that COVID line that he brings up that i wanted to point out just before i forget and while that was fresh on my mind was and again this is very so incredibly prescient i think of the time that the book is being written and now with COVID, it, it intensifies this to sharp relief as far as the dislocation of production to the to the home significant movement of the economy to offloaded from the factory this has been going on right through deindustrialization but now COVID is a inflection point where the site of production is removed even further. There's, there's a very, this kind of fits into his whole model of simulacra and code and like these, this procession of moving of like the switching of the productive economy into this production and miasma of signs and exchange. This definitely accords with what he's already saying here, which is that the factories may be gone or may, may be starting to go away, but really the factory has invaded all of, all of life. Yes, right. And, yeah. and I think that that is true. It's just that here it's in, in our typical mode, obviously there are still factories, still workers. We were just talking about one, right? The Frito-Lay factory. But in, in terms of the domesticization of, of the, the typical labor, we're talking about like, there are no more cubicles. The cubicles have, have infiltrated all of society, right? You, we, yeah. the, the, there's a cubicle in the home. Every home is, is a, a, a segmented into cubicles or something like that. Yeah. Also consumption becomes a form of labor as well, which is part of that movement. The reason you're given a wage is the wage is more so, so you can purchase, so you can consume, and perform a, another labor in your in the yep. time that you're not laboring is you have not only on the domination of the factory floor back in you know the industrial revolution where the conditions are awful etc and you're merely producing to in a form of like bare life almost now well, it's we, yeah it's to the point where you are fully you are never off the clock especially you know people like us too that are digital you know, digital, social media, et cetera, right? We're always producing websites, Facebooks, Twitter, et cetera, right? The That's podcast. right. We're still producing content for the machine. And our information is is a part of that right. process too. The our consumption of products feeds back into the into these information loops which are which right. are used. They prop uh, one another up. Like it's the, it's like our, the life and death drive propping one another up almost. Right in a sense. You know, I mean, work. in Marxist Grun, he does kind of intimate that consumption and production have this modality. So Baudrillard isn't necessarily saying something too radical. Right. It's, it's just the, the means of what he sees in contemporary life and the ways in which consumption becomes production or, or becomes another form of labor. I think that that's where he, he gives more details and, and fills out Marx's intuition. And we know that this is true. I mean, we think about, I remember in 2000, after 2008, you know, around the time of 
the stimulus packages. Mm -hmm. And you could hear not just the conservative economists, but you could hear kind of the liberal ones too, but they're also conservative. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, you, you could hear across the spectrum this bemoaning of the fact that people were given these checks from the government and the whole hope was that they would go out and spend that money and put that money back into businesses, back into circulation. Whereas the what was bemoaned was the fact that many of them took that and put it into the bank. Well, now, see, I now think it was more so the phenomenon of the bailouts on the other side of that was the banks sure. were given money, but they didn't lend it out. <laughs> no, no, but, that, but, that, but see, that's that's the more macro side. I mean, because, it's even hilarious. Because like, this to, is, oh, no, go ahead. no, I was just saying because it's easier for economists on as fucking talking heads to talk shit about individuals and their right. patterns yeah. rather than to get to the real heart of the matter, which was in the I mean, the cause itself was fucking banks making bets on shitty subprime loans, right? These bundles of bad shit that nobody wanted. Mm -hmm. Anyway, go on. Yeah. Well, I was going to say in the movie, there's a movie that HBO did called Too Big to Fail about the crisis. Right. And I just rem I watched that recently and just recalled that that was one of the things is we, the taxpayers bailed out the corporations, et cetera, the banks, the investment banks, and including... Well, AIG was a, its own kind of thing, but yep. then they didn't, none of that was reciprocated. The gift was given, <laughs> in that sense, the gift was reversed. Like right. The taxpayers give the gift of life to the, back to the. Which is why the conservative line about running government as a business doesn't hold, right? I mean, if government was run as a business, then, then they would have had all the power in the world to have entered into these lucrative means of jostling the banks to to lend at a time when when it was needed most but yeah i mean it's the same it's, it's it is very much the same thing we saw this too in the most recent example of giving these tax breaks and giving money to corporations and whatever it was all about oh well they'll they'll pay for now they'll be able to afford more jobs when really the, all they do is buy back their stocks right yeah and, and, and enrich their bottom line because it's all and yeah that's the move away from that's the the possession of simulacra as it relates to political economy is that it's not no longer it's like this disentanglement of any kind of real production to virtual production it's about this finance capital is totally detaching itself yeah it has some it's not completely disentangled from the real but it is largely so and increasingly moving in the direction of totally divorcing itself from any kind of real economic production, et cetera. Right. Yeah. I, I, um, you see Baudrillard talking about the same thing in his Requiem for the Media essay, which came out in 71. He says many of the same things he's saying in chapter one, which is basically that the, the question of the contents of the media misses the point, right? It is the yeah. form itself right. that is the gift that can't be reciprocated. The best we can, the only examples you could really give, especially in the 70s, would be like quiz shows where you're participating in a way that you're just giving a stock answer to an, to an encyclopedic question. It's not even a price, you know, it's not about, I mean, Deleuze himself says that he was able to determine the problems has the power. And so the media, you know, the best he gives in the best case scenarios, it always seems like the way to counter gift, to give back, to reverse the relation is to become owners of the means of distribution of media. We saw some of this in like, especially in like the 90s and 2000s when the internet was first getting off and you had stuff like Napster and LimeWire and torrents these ways of participating in yeah. the distribution of media and we saw what in many cases what american law especially started to crack down on these things i mean napster is the most it was a reinstatement of the commons that had been taken um and then it was recaptured vert digitally as well like these right first first the commons were physically imposed upon by capital and now the digital commons have been completely foreclosed by capital 
it's interesting, right? Because not all countries have laws like this. This is why we can still use LibGen and, and things like that. So, yeah. you know, however we want to think about Russia and its own problems, and I'm not trying to compare them with America, but they're just one of the examples of using LibGen for us to get PDFs and things like that. And that's the weird thing, right? Because this is where Leotard's argument about nation states being defunct, losing, ha- facing a crisis of legitimacy insofar as capital doesn't give, give a shit about national borders, right? I mean, the movement of global capital doesn't really care about that stuff. And yet it is one of its constraints is, is the nation state form. And we see that especially in patent law, especially, I mean, like... Well, is, is this the schizophrenia of capitalism? But intellectual property is a useful tool for for um, capital accumulation. Yes. But at the same time, there's an old sort of Silicon Valley ethos. It's the idea that information wants to be free. And it's sort of information, yeah, like there's some... It's sort of teleological structure is to become free, almost controlling the flows of information is extremely difficult to do. And that just goes to show the whole structure of IP law, right? How difficult it is to prevent capitalism is working against itself in this kind of sense. But that's, I don't know. I don't know how that works for capitalism other than like maybe looking at it as this way, like I said, in a different function of uh, the death drive and the life drive, propping one another up or propelling one another or whatever pushing each other forward in this kind of dialectical motion. Yeah, it is interesting to think that, you know, in the digital sphere, in the hardware, software, coupling, conjunction sphere, you have, you know, you do have operating systems like Linux, like Unix, and these others that are meant to be modular, meant to be open source, right? We were talking about the commons. And then you obviously have the domination of bigger corporations like you see uh, the opposite trend in, in uh, international patent law with with things like iPhones, right? Apple, it's a lot of its patents on are are not about improvements. They are patenting these these. It's almost a dumbing down or or a defect that they are patenting and encasing in their uh, in their phones. So there's these different tendencies, right? I mean, you can talk about it in terms of you know, anarchism or neoliberalism. And of course, Baudrillard is critiquing neoliberalism here. I think his, his main assumption is that, that whether it be today in 2021 or in 76, you know, we are living in the aftermath of, or in the wake of, a, of the neoliberal order. Right. Or um, some type of mutated variant of capitalism that is a distinctly different from its previous incarnation. But I think it's interesting here too, especially with intellectual property, because what intellectual property does is it really brings into sharp relief the relation of capital and intellectual property. Specifically, what that represents clearly is dead labor. And now this is something too that I've always felt is a fantastic critique of capitalism to someone is what gets swept aside in all of this is all of the dead labor of all of the people that contributed to the development of something like fucking math, for example. Try to run capitalism uh, without algebra. Try that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. But guess what? If if fucking, uh, you know, in 800 or whenever the, whenever the fuck algebra was invented, right? If they had, if patent law had existed at that point, that's the fucking like really kind of maddening thing for me is... The circulation of knowledge... Uh, or just like the way that knowledge is human knowledge via like the whole like the collectivity of the human race isn't owned by any one individual. Like it just goes to show you that this kind of private property is bullshit. The whole thing would collapse. Something like IP law had existed whenever something like calculus was invented, right? Yeah. But- like imagine if the Newton family had a, a patent for calculus and then like you would have to buy a license to use calculus to perform whatever, et cetera, et cetera. Like then you multiply that out by all the little innovations that have occurred over the years based on these fundamental discoveries, theories, et cetera, right? Things like encyclopedias, things like- It's like, oh yeah, uh, I guess what I'm, I'm, I'm going to patent the, the English language uh, and you got to pay me a licensing fee to fucking use it. Well, that is a self-defeating- the only way capitalism gets to where it is is because of these open source 
projects that are not necessarily open source, really, but things that are so predate the maturity of capitalism in its current iteration that they render it almost impossible to form. This was one area where Obama was a bit more progressive than obviously someone like Bill Clinton or, or other Democratic candidates for presidency. And, and he, he really didn't, I believe this was when he was running for re-election. So this line only really works against someone like Mitt Romney, mm -hmm. you know, working for Bain Capital and, and whatever which is obviously like a bad name. In any case, he's attacking the conservative slogan of we built that, which was kind of their, their slogan. That was the, with, with Palin, with, you may have seen some of that with McCain too, but like, especially around his reelection time, he's, he's like, no, you didn't build that because infrastructure, right? It, it's a collective project. You, yeah. you know, all these okay. capitalistic en endeavors are uh, only made possible through the collective as you said, the the accumulation of dead labor, the accumulation of possible, knowledge, yeah. Right. yeah, the accumulation of knowledge, uh, and he, which is just another iteration of dead labor on. I mean, ultimately. yeah, he he never really stuck with that because he he did get some pushback, and and there were times, there were a lot of times when whenever uh, Republicans or or the right wing would cry and bitch and moan, he would he would back down. You know, he was he was always trying to do the quote unquote do the right thing, reach across the aisle, and that kind of. You know, I mean, obviously our electoral system is uh is fucking. It's built for for gridlock these days, or at least it's. I mean, it's this. That's the perfect example of the simulation. It's all fucking theater. It's all just miasma of signs exchange and frothing right. and so forth, without any kind of. It's a whole simulated political economy at this point. It's all it's all falling into that spectacular mode. But um, there's a there's a scene that I want to mention. Wanted to bring up from season one of The Wire. It's one of the middle episodes where it's a scene in the projects. They have this little central area where they kind of set up for the drug, drug dealers, right? And there's three of them are talking. And one of them eat, is eating like McDonald's chicken nuggets, kind of like marveling. Yeah, man, they got the bone out of the chicken and everything. You can just get right to it. You don't have to be worrying about bones or greasy hands or anything. And uh, they say, I bet the guy that invented these chicken nuggets is a millionaire right now. And then one of the older drug dealers is like, you're fucking crazy. That man is getting paid a dollar or something. Something He's living in the basement trying to dream up another idea on how to make the fries better or some shit. And I was like, yes, boom, that as much of a fucking lib as David Simon is, he at least got it there. Right. And understood. And this is another point that to me brings into sharp relief why someone, the kind of argumentation that is used in a book like Atlas Shrugged is utter bullshit. It's the laborers who are getting, who should be going on strike. It's not the fucking capitalist. The capitalists are the parasites. They are the parasites that are extracting the life force of labor. They literally consume bodies. Right. Very directly, yeah. they consume bodies. That's why I was, I was tweeting last night about capitalism requires human sacrifice effectively is what it is mammon right i mean we we saw that directly with with but with the relations Pope. are obscured right it's like it's not so stark as the aztec ritual sacrifice no right it's obscured behind the code behind signs behind the miasma of it etc cetera, etc cetera. but anyways we saw that especially in the south i mean you and i i live in georgia you live in texas we saw how covid was handled and how the governors couldn't wait to quote unquote, reopen the states. Right. The lockdowns that we had were minimal at best because it's like, it's a complete disavowal. It's like, well, you know, we did our, we did our best. Now go out and go to McDonald's and, you know, who cares if you drop dead, that's, that's fucking, that's, that's a statistic. Doesn't matter. It's, right? it's a weird kind of uh, parallel because if you think about this in this context of the capitalist giving life, so we're looking at the state. The state refuses to give life. They refuse the gift of life to the sitter. So that's what I'm saying that we have – that's why COVID brings this whole thing so, like in such sharp relief is because capitalism is not concerned about giving the gift of life anymore. It's no longer concerned about even giving the appearance of that. Right. We've moved into a different epoch or era where there, there's no longer the pretense of any kind of – 
I don't know. Liberal democracy is like obviously it's it's on its deathbed, right? Well, I mean, but you also saw this too with uh in, with with China, right? In the late seventies, early eighties, when they implemented the one child policy, this question of giving the gift of life, and you know, the, what they at least what the fear was that without some kind of radical change in terms of population growth, the state would collapse, right? And so a huge propaganda uh, move, but not just propaganda, also policy of, you know, if you have more than one child outside certain radical circumstances, they literally are going to bulldoze your house, right? We're literally going to uh, make you homeless for violating this policy. And so you had huge movements of of euthanasia for sterilization, babies left to die in the market, you know, shit like that. I mean, I'm not really even focusing on China's atrocities. I'm just trying to say it's not just a necessarily a liberal thing, right? This question of well, I mean, of, arguably of this, one would say. Well, I I just meant that if we consider unless we consider that policy of China as liberal, right? It, it's just similar to your argument about, about the, it's no longer necessarily about giving life there. It was about impeding it at least uh, to okay, a certain gotcha. extent. You okay, know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I, now I see what you're doing. in 2015, they now have said, oh, two child policy because certain reasons, not the least of which is that everyone wants a fucking boy. And so at some point you're just going to have a huge spike of males who are, who, who <laughs> which is hilarious yeah. because um, typically that's seen as the most dangerous situation is to have a high having a population that skews heavily towards young men is a dangerous yep. I mean, and, and, wise. And, and historians conservatives especially conservative historians have talked about war as a means of keeping those numbers low <laughs> but also i mean that's part of what the global imperialist project is doing right it's not only make work project for whatever the government i mean there's so right. many there's so much that goes into it it's it's not a single entity like it, it's achieving three or four different ends all at once one is to right it has to stabilize the world markets for its own reproduction that's a big component of that need for em empire always pushing and expanding into new markets etc yeah 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 things that were previously deemed unsaleable or obscene or te really territory whenever china and the u.s regained trade relations in the 70s with nixon etc right that's true yeah it's a totally new market yeah it's uh okay so at that point and this is right around the same time that all of this these theories are coming before it's very much entwined with this development of, of capital the crisis of capital during the beginning of the neoliberal period is that there is every uh, Europe has recovered from the destruction of World War II. They're beginning to compete with America. There's profitability. Competition has increased. The world markets are more dynamic. The hegemony of the U.S. consumer is, though still big, it's obviously beginning really its way. It's winding down to a degree, right? I think that's that's a decades long process, but I think you can see the U.S. consumer, especially like now, it's a different market than like the 90s, where I think consumption was far more robust and seemed unassailable. Whereas now, I think because of this capitals, it being okay to not give the gift of life back to the labor, it doesn't really care, it doesn't really need those excess bodies or their consumption. Even that seems schizophrenic right or like not schizophrenic but there's a there's a certain contradiction present there the surplus of bodies especially male bodies you see this in the societies that pierre claster is looking at in society against the state right he's looking at the the Gayaki indians and he's showing that there is this almost there's almost two to three men for every woman and the way that they solve the problem and keep harmony is polyandrism, which is women take more than one husband. Yeah. And that's that's just the, the elegant solution that they have, even though the individual husbands may not necessarily like sharing the women. This is just I mean, that's part of the that's the rule. It's the law. It's right. harsh, but it's but it's the law. You got to you got to do it anyway. Do we want to Mr. Baudrillard, do we want to? You you have you've been sitting on a quote. Do you want to look at this? 
I was sitting on this quote, uh, this went back to, I had brought up about COVID and how the move to work from home is something that kind of brought everything into sharp relief. And Baudrillard, I think, is interestingly bringing this shit up at like, you know, 74, 75, whenever he's writing this book. And I think this quote will kind of bring that to fore here. This movement of, this displacement of the factory onto, I don't know, it's just a, like a further entrenchment of this. This is the tendency of every current strategy that turns around labor. Job enrichment, flex time, mobility, retraining, continuing ed, autonomy, worker management, decentralization of the labor process, even the Californian utopia of domestic cybernetics. Your quotidian roots are no longer savagely ripped up in order to hand you over to the machine. You, your childhood, your habits, your relationships, your unconscious drives, and even your refusal to work are integrated into it. You'll easily find a place for yourself amongst all of this, a personalized job, or failing that, there's a welfare provision calculated according to your personal needs. Yeah, this is where it's fascinating. This is where I was thinking about some of Yang, Andrew Yang's popu- uh, right, popularity. The UBI but, stuff, yeah. Because, yeah, because he's, because this one pet uh, project was, and, and I'm not saying that it's, you know, uh, in itself wrong uh, of universal basic income. And here Baudrillard is saying, that's just another form of a symbolic gift. Oh, that, it's the ultimate. It's the ultimate form. Yeah, it's the ultimate form. Yeah, anyway, it's, that can never be gifted back, right? That, that, I think for Baudrillard, for, from his logical point of view, that is something that is the, the height, the quintessence of his, his argument about not, of being um, power kind of stockpiling and giving these, these gifts that we can't, uh, that we can't, this infinite debt that we can't pay back, right? Symbolically. Yeah. Except with my violent death. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, because it's Which interesting, even right? Even that, that gets, even death gets foreclosed by the system later on. And I think that's what he writes about. And he writes about, he get, actually does critique it a bit here uh, with terrorism a little bit, right? He kind of says that it's there's some there's something very symbolic about hostage taking to the system that it kind of erupts in a way that is this kind of symbolic blackmail he calls it. Yeah, there's that quote, but there's a better one I think, because he almost gives this part of the book the praxis element is that you give death as the gift that the system can't handle or can't accept or like yeah is the reverse gift, but. I mean, at the very end of the chapter, yeah. If you look at a situation like 9-11, I think you even see that is has been foreclosed upon because all all that 9-11 did, it was not a it didn't destabilize the system. It made a it just hypercharged it. It hypercharged it, right? This hypercharged yeah, imperialism, yeah. All of it. Yeah. The worst the worst inclinations of certainly America, but the global capitalist system were were just redoubled. So in that sense, even death is not – even death can be reincorporated back into the system at that scale, at the level of trauma of a 9-11. Obviously, death is not a – look at the people sacrificing themselves to – you know, the, the first frontline workers at grocery stores, et cetera, throughout the pandemic that have been sacrificing themselves for what, you know, for consumption. Someone has to consume, you know, or the whole system breaks down. The whole yeah. system is par- – is, it's again, too, this is what I always think is so amusing. People always give the financial advice of – what's the common refrain? Don't buy, don't buy avocado toast and, and Starbucks coffee. But if people actually if, – if everyone listened to that advice, the economy would collapse. The economy is predicated on waste. Yeah, I'm, and I mean obviously – Capitalism can give you whatever you, uh, can give you plenty to waste. Yeah, and even the he's even critical of the ecological model of recycling. Oh yeah, which also is just another. But it's partially a, a it, like myth UBI, anyway. Like UBI, it's very it just is the ultimate entrenchment of. Since we were talking about free to lay, one of the things I was thinking about was how right now they're striking. Correct. Yeah. And he's got a he's got a pretty good section on strikes. On the strikes, yeah. I think some of that I thought was interesting, where he says a lot of what this chapter kind of sets up is in the olden days when political economy was ascendant. Here's you know revolution was the mode, blah blah blah. Here he doesn't say anything but strikes that you know in the 
in the old days, strikes were, he calls it an organized violence for purposes of snatching a fraction of surplus value or else power from the opposing violence of capital. And he says, this type of strike is dead today. He gives some examples about well, one of the things that I think is important is he shows that the unions began to lose their representative power. Their representativity itself began to crumble after 68. And they even say that, he even says that the unions were the ones who uh, basically who ended 68. And, and what's funny is his point is that at a certain point in the crisis, the powers that be, the bosses, whatever, they were willing to make certain concessions. Right. They were willing to give better wages. Exactly. They were willing to cut hours, yada, yada. And, and yet, at the, end of the, at the end of the day, when the unions basically caved and fucked over the workers, workers didn't end up any better. And yet things, things started to move along. And so his point, he says... Capital itself only alienates labor power and its product. It's only monopoly, monopoly is production. Parties and unions alienate social power from the exploited and have a monopoly on representation. Right. Calling them into question is a revolutionary historical development, but this development is paid for by a loss of clarity, a loss of resolution, an apparent regression, the absence of continuity, logic, and objectives, et cetera. This is because everything becomes uncertain when it's a matter of confronting one's own repressive agency of driving the unionist shop steward official or spokesperson from one's own head. And so he talks about, he starts to begin to talk about this crisis of representation in the unions and that the, the workers began to lose faith in the unions and their ability to negotiate on their behalf. And at that point, that's when the bosses double down and see that the unions have lost power and then can more straight away fuck the, the workers over and double down on their hardline stance. We see this, especially in America, with right to work states. Is Texas yes. a right to work state? Yeah, absolutely. So I assume Georgia is, is if not a, a, a pure right to work state like Almost Texas. Almost assuredly, is, yeah. It's probably, I mean, like it's obviously the, the Bible. Most belt. of the Sun Belt is that way, mm -hmm. yeah, which is why they can attract. That's why Atlanta and Austin are growing, is because it's a race to the bottom. Yeah. And so I think that Baudrillard's analysis of money, wages, strikes in this chapter, the one thing that resonated me most was with all the flimsy conservative arguments uh, of for right to work and how bad the unions are. And I think that Baudrillard might say that there is a logic to, to the conservative attack on unions, which are just money grubbing, they're going to take your wages, blah, blah, blah. To a certain extent, having lived through it in France and seeing what the unions eventually did for the workers, he would say, yeah, they have some point there. Now, on the other hand, we do know, just looking statistically, that, that union involvement in capitalism gets all these gains. But his point being, that type of strike, because of this crisis of representativity, that type of belief in the unions, we've seen that now there really is no like coordinating, organizing logic. Yeah, I hope that he's wrong. I hope that that's, again, a kind of cynical or nihilistic proclamation. And I hope that the workers of the Frito-Lay, because one of the things he doesn't talk about in, in strikes, even classical strikes, is, for example, the role of the scab, what we call a scab, strike breakers. Yeah. He doesn't really mention those. And maybe that's that logic wasn't necessarily apparent or at work in... Um, in 68, it doesn't seem like the reason why 68 didn't work or why the, the workers didn't come out ahead after their mass strike. It's not because of scabs or strike breakers, right? It, it's, it is because of the conservatism of the labor unions and the Communist Party in France, right? Yeah, it seems to have been a, uh, a kind of concerted, I don't know if it's reactionary or if it's this I mean, it's what Deleuze and Guattari talk about this resurrecting an old body, an old social body, an old socius, or reinvesting in an old body, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I kind of mentioned that you can be consciously revolutionary and yet unconsciously desiring a reactionary right. mode. Yeah. And so there it does seem like, I mean, Deleuze himself, I think 
this is an anti Oedipus. I'm trying to remember, but Deleuze himself talks about how de Gaulle, I think it's in Oedipus, where he talks about how the men of state, they weren't necessarily the ones closest on the ground, like in the unions or in the parties, but yet they noticed a kind of imperceptible fluctuation of desire and that, and it's that ability to gauge the uh, that that kind of movement that allowed the state to get the get the upper hand. Uh, I'm not really saying it very well, but I think that that's that's concomitant or that's 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 the same thing as them saying how the party is always articulating that the conditions on the ground are not right for revolution yeah. or whatever. Right. And it's that and 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 Leotard himself is basically saying that you know the party one joins the party, one's in the party because one wants to direct events. One wants to be in the lead, right? One wants to be in the vanguard and lead the, the masses when that's not how desire works. That's not right. how mass movements accumulate critical mass. Along those lines, I was thinking about that made me remember this quote from the book where he mentions dialectical materialism getting out of hand, which would have been obviously the theoretical toolbox that the French Communist Party was playing with, you know, largely speaking at this point. Good Hegelians, good Maoists, good Stalinists, yeah. I'll read this here. A machine has to function if it is to reproduce relations of production. A commodity must have a use value in order to sustain the system of exchange value. This was the first level scenario. Simulation is today at the second level. A commodity must function as an exchange value in order better to hide the fact that it circulates like a sign and reproduces the code. Society has to reproduce itself as class society, as class struggle. It must function at the Marxian critical level in order the better to mask the system's real law and the possibility of its symbolic destruction. Marcuse pointed out a long time ago that dialectical materialism was getting out of hand. Far from being deconstructed by the forces of production, the relations of production from now on submit to the forces of production, science, technology, etc., and find a new legitimacy in them. There again, we must pass on to the second level, social relations of symbolic domination utterly submit to the pro mode of production, both the forces of production and the relations of production, where we find in the apparent movement of political economy and the revolution, a new legitimacy and the most perfect alibi. <laughs> this is good too. Hence the necessity of resurrecting and dramatizing political economy in the form of a movie script to screen out the threat of symbolic destruction. Hence the kind of crisis, the perpetual simulacrum of a crisis we are dealing with today, which you could, that little paragraph, you could say, how many times could you have said that since 1976? Yeah, the simulation of a crisis to hide real crises or something like that, right? I mean, Marx himself pointed out that Crises are not anomalous to capitalism; that it's it's yeah, part it parcel of its of its function. Right. Yeah. So, like simulating the crisis to to cover it up. There's, I mean, this is why he. I, I assume it's positive, but you know, when he says the old logic of striking was to get a little more surplus value, to be exploited a little bit less, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we've talked about whether it be work hours or we could. You know, in, in the U.S., we could talk about getting health benefits, right, which is why we're so ass backwards in terms of healthcare in the world. But he talks about a strike for strike's sake. Do you remember this section? He said, strike for strike's sake is the true condition of the contemporary struggle, unmotivated with neither objective nor political referent. It is the oppositional response adopted against a production which is also unmotivated with neither a referent nor a social use value nor any other finality than its own production for production's sake revolving, uh, in short, a system which has become only a system of reproduction revolving around itself in a gigantic totology of the labor process. Strike for strike's sakes is the com complementary totology, but since it unveils a new form of capital corresponding to the final stage of the law of value, it is also subversive. And his main point is that I guess that's the thing is where, I mean, for Baudrillard, where, it, where can we articulate the forces of subversion in the in the system like yeah. what is subversive to right the yeah exactly uh, i don't know little, what seems like at yeah. this point i don't know what is yeah leotard seems a little bit uh skeptical of this but leaving him aside 
mean like what Baudrillard is trying to push us towards, at least by the end of this chapter. Now you said the rest of the book might have something different, but it is this notion that if power is death deferred, then immediate death is the, is the only counter gift. Right. And he even says, he even ends the chapter with a kind of nice cliffhanger by saying, even the dream of my immediate violent death is, is subversive. Right. To me, yeah. that equivocates, equivocates to suicide or a terrorist praxis, which with my evidence of 9-11, I think negates that liberatory. Even this is absorbed within the simulation, within the code. There is no gift that we can counter gift that capitalism can be given to that it won't accept. Like it will, it will, it will absorb everything. Yeah, this is this is interesting. This question of hostage taking, this question of suicide bombing, or you know, I mean, we can include the nine eleven stuff there. In a thousand plateaus, you know, Deleuze and Guattari talk about signifying regimes of signs, counter-signifying regimes of signs, right? The, in the counter-signifying, you have the barbarian hordes, the Mongolian hordes who are, who are uh, threatening the state, right? The, whether it be the Roman Empire or the great empires, right? Yeah. Um, and there's something, obviously, it's, it's not like, oh, counter-signifying good, but there are elements of interest for them. And I think that, you know, with the rise of capitalism, which, you know, uh, is abstract flows, decoding shit, blah, blah, blah. It's deterritorializing. I think that what's interesting is that you see in the same, you know, kind of like a whack-a-mole or like, you know, you're pushing pressure down on one point, yeah. but it comes up on another where you, right. see the, you see the rise of fundamentalisms. Yeah. And you know, some of those forms of fundamentalism, as we know, and Christianity has it too, are, are seeking war, are seeking disruption. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's even the definition of terrorism, right, is disrupting the normal individual's everyday life, right, your activities of consumption and production and, and yada yada. It's, I think that that's why you know, with Bodra, as you said, he gets cynic more cynical later in life. I think that that's why, in my opinion, the reason why 9-11 gets co-opted by the system and, and even bolsters it in all of its most repressive forms, including mass surveillance, spying on Americans, you know, uh, information gathering, blah, 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 you know, the, the growth of the counterintelligence superpower or whatever. I think a part of it is that it was not something that happened from within, right? What we, what we see today is domestic terrorism is like much, wait. much yeah. more of a, it's much, much more salient than, than ever. It's much more salient than Islamic terrorism, which was the boogeyman of, of the aughts. Well, see, I, both are, I think they're both endogenous to the system itself because of imperialism, right? And imperialism itself necessitates a re reaction on the other side, the whole rise of fundamentalism is the, I don't know, that's the dialectic response or whatever, the dialectic of what have you. And now yeah, the I mass enemy, the, now the mass shooting phenomenon, again, that's its own endogenous alienation, the destruction of the social, et cetera, social bonds, social relations getting completely atomized. It's weird, right? Because I feel like with mass shooting as an example, analogously to a form of domestic terrorism, you see a kind, a similar kind of scapegoating, right? You have the Islamic other that we can go over and we can fight our wars and, and you know, our military industrial complex, we can get off on all that. We know how much spending that the state, you know, uses on that in America. We know that it's more than the next five, six, ten countries combined, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's a kind of demonization of the other that gives power, that, that is manipulated. You see this with um, the same kind of scapegoating with mass shooters where it's just, oh, well, those, those people were mentally ill. Right. It always becomes back to a mental health yeah, uh, boogeyman. Exactly. Individual responsibility. Yes. This person, this right. was a deranged individual. This is right. not indicative of the system. Everything is going fine. Right. And so, you know, you see the same kind of scapegoating and yet at the same time, that boogeyman is, never turns into more, more money, more investment into 
bettering mental health. Right. It's law enforcement. It's it's repressive right. it's, state apparatus. It's law enforcement who are trained in the worst ways. Right. At yeah, least exactly. on average, at least statistically, to deal with mental health disturbances or even or even just random fucking social, anything at this point. Yeah. yeah fucking right. anything at this point. It's right. They total, are. They are. Yeah. It's like, they're fucking thugs, man. They're fucking yeah. thugs. I saw a video this morning. It's just, it's total fucking madness. It makes me fucking sick. I don't want to <laughs> focus on that too much, but no, no, no. I, I understand. I understand. I, 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 you know, I, you're right though, that the, the investment gets put into police, you know, into police uh, stations and it's not to train them to deal with the mentally ill better or yeah. to deal with social disruptions in a, in a peaceful way. It's to give them tanks and fucking armored vehicles and more weapons Right, because it's and what's interesting, I would have thought that Remington and these other companies, these other gun companies would have uh, would have been secretly bankrolling Obama because Obama yeah, really right. was Obama was the one who fucking <laughs> you know doubled and tripled their their yeah. uh, their income. I mean, it's the same um, thing. Only only Nixon could go to China is almost the same logic. Follow that up. What what exactly? So it's only the only the opposite party person can do that signification gives them more uh, ability to support the system because like you said obama ostensibly taking the position of being anti-gun itself just crosses more gun i mean that's getting at the symbolic logic that i think maybe that's what yeah obama's gonna take the, our guns the obama's symbolic logic work. that baudrillard or like the mechanistic element of the whole exchange thing is that's why it's so difficult is because anything you kind of do to mitigate effects simply reinforces them yeah i mean this whole thing that obama is going to take our guns it is highly just increase the demand for like you right like that's why that's the the black man's going to castrate right yeah exactly right i mean that's that's the symbolic threat very Um, very good yeah you know and, and it's all wrapped in conspiracy Right. Of course, of course, Obama isn't literally saying he's going to take our guns because because that's the secret agenda. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's the end game. Right. If a Democrat went to China to open up relations with China, it would be seen as a communist plot or like, right? Yeah. Parti- right. You know, especially at this period ar- around the Nixon era. Right. Oh, Jimmy yeah. Carter. Jimmy Carter could never go to China. Even though he is, and he actually is one of the, he's even more responsible for the neoliberal shit than fucking Nixon is. He's the one that really got all that shit going. And so it's always that opposition. The opposition party is always the one that can do, can achieve what the the end of the other side of the dialectic. Only George W. Bush could get Medicare B through. Right. Obama tried to expand Medicare to get Medicare B there's opposition, but or part D, the paying for old people's right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, that's the one I was referring to. So that was a, a W. Bush policy. Again, never could have happened without this sign of conservative, and that's the reverse on other issues like gun control, or I mean, not exactly is, not gun control, but um, you know, I guess the Nixon example too, yeah. the countervailing tendency. I mean, it's the same thing with not pushing for Medicare for all or single payer. Obamacare, a, the ACA. Um, right. Yeah. Exactly. It's the power the, of the signs. Like you can just just with the sign, I can disable your whole fucking your entire legislative agenda. Even though it it did give get more healthcare to more people, and that it's good. You see that the overarching structure is to keep the whole system in place. Yes. Exactly. And to really, really, then you're just giving. You're actually bettering the bottom line of the insurance companies and re-entrenching them even more so. Certainly, yeah, especially with the, uh, with the individual ACA. mandate, especially with the individual mandate element of it in particular, which is one that the conservatives didn't like, but it was really a capitalism. boon in a sense. Like, it's, that's it was trapped. capitalism. It's a, capture, it's a captured market. Yeah, yeah. You're, it's a you're, monopolistic market. You have to You're have, getting them more customers. You have to have insurance. Right, so far from being, you know, government healthcare or whatever, it was like maximal, maximal corporate healthcare. Right. Yeah, exactly. It's like that's, the U- that's it's the, like irony. the same UBI kind of logic is in play here, because it's so much like he says it's the symbolic shit is what rules the code or like the semiotic order is what rules, and those signs are totally detached from anything, any kind of referential whatever. Right. And so, I don't know. It feels like he's right and is anticipating 
the political moment that we're in, I think even more strikingly than in, in his own era. I mean, among among Deleuze, Guattari, Lyotard, etc., Baudrillard seems to be the most vindicated by his critique of capitalism, not necessarily in the praxis that he offers here, because he does offer a sort of poetics, et cetera, that we'll get into, I think, in chapter six. But, you know, I think he he criticizes or he mentions Deleuze and Guattari and acknowledges, yeah, he may uh, give seed the ground or agree that there's a machinic unconscious, but that there is no liberatory, the schizoanalytic liberation is not even, is blunted by that, by simulacra. Yeah, yeah, I think that, um, I think that it's hard not to associate Deleuze and Guattari with a liberatory project, even though I think that that's wrong headed. I think that it's hard not to see it when one of the stakes of you know, the revolutionary machine and the analytic machine functioning together is partly to dismantle repressive reactionary structures. We saw this in Tom McGowan's book on capitalism and desire, where one of his critiques of the of critical theory in the Frankfurt School and Marcuse and these others is this argument about repression and about capitalism's repression and him being a little bit wary of that. So, but, but you know, I think that Deleuze and Guattari are, are, are much closer to Foucault and his critique of, you know, sexual liberation insofar as I don't think it's so straightforward as merely about dismantling repressive institutions. Yeah. But again, I, I mean, it's obvious that Bojer, and I wanted to talk about this in general uh, before we go back to some, some good juicy quotes some juicy quotes. <laughs> it's obvious that in the preface especially, but in chapter one, you see it as well, that Baudrillard is, is laboring under a, this shadow, the shadow of Leotard, the shadow of Deleuze and Guattari, this shadow of a kind of anxiety of influence. It's obvious that he's trying to get his angers in and trying to yeah. differentiate what he's doing from the other two. And I think that in that sense, I'm not fully convinced that his critiques are well-founded. I just think that they're necessary to try to say... Like, his critiques hey, of Deleuze and Guattari and Lyotard or just capital? Yeah, yeah, no, capital. no, 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 of them specifically. Okay, gotcha. That I think that they lack teeth. I think that they're interesting as, as indicators of the fact that he's acknowledging that he's within this lineage, this post-68 poly political sphere that you were talking about earlier. I think he has to. I think he has to acknowledge it. Not to acknowledge it would be even more of a kind of symbolic indebtedness. Mm -hmm. So I think he's disavowing that indebtedness to them in a way that lacks teeth. Whereas, as we saw, you and I looking back over Leotard's libidinal economy, Leotard is constantly buggering Baudrillard. And one of the things is his argument that there are no primitive societies, right? Yeah. His argument that, that Baudrillard... Here I agree with Leotard. Here I agree yeah. with Leotard. In a sense. Yeah. But then again, I, I'm not sure... If you remember, too, in McGowan's book, he kind of implicates or in, intimates that... Was it... Um, but you sort of gives the natural... The sort of naturalistic element of capitalism itself... He sort as of being is, a given. He gives you're right. He seeds that ground as a given. Yeah, and we 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 did we did talk about that, and 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 you were you were uh, saying it was kind of his Maoist background. Is that right? I mean, I kind of would potentially think that's why he would. I don't know. That's like a whole materialist. I don't know dialectic thing that I don't quite understand. Yeah, this is where I think Deleuze and Guattari would be different from Leotard because Leotard wants to say there are no primitive societies. And part of that is due to Pierre Claster and his his argumentation about stateless societies and how it's not like they're lacking a state and, and or that, you know, you just need a little bit more time in history before the white men came and they would have had a state. Like he's right. saying, no, it's, it's a radical disjunction yes, and exactly. separation. Correct. And I think for Leotard, his way of reading into that, that all states are capitalist, I think that Deleuze and Guattari are a little bit, I mean, I think there Leotard may be uh, being hyperbolically uh, polemical. I think Deleuze Certainly. and Guattari are, are very careful to try to show how if capitalism, if quote unquote all societies are capitalistic, like Leotard says, it's, it's in fact because stateless societies or what they call the primitive territorial machine, they are haunted 
by capitalism, by its image, and that therefore they ward it off. For example, you know, when, when Claster critiques the notion of primitive societies as quote unquote subsistence, he shows that not only do they have a surplus, they usually have at least enough food to feed twice as many people. Yeah. It's not about a surplus. It's about the fact that they don't work more than they need to. They, he was looking at ethnographic data and saying like all activities considered in terms of production, individuals work like three hours a day. Yeah. And you also have to, like we said earlier, another thing they didn't have, and even the more early industrial society didn't have was this obligation to consume as another form of labor as well. Right. This, yeah, we talked about that earlier. I mean, it's... Um, to consume a sign for the sake of its own, for the sake of consumption, without any reference to an actual need of any kind whatsoever, total displacement from need, completely simulated, right. sort of injecting itself <clears throat> into the code of the drives, yeah, and this like is- attaching itself to the code of the drives. This is, this is where Baudrillard and Marx are, are, are very close when they discuss the notion of needs being produced in the cycle of production and consumption. Obviously, Baudrillard wants to talk about it in terms of science systems. We see this in, for clusters, stateless societies or societies against the state. Their needs are relative to the the milieu in which they you know in, in which they they live whether it be nomadic in terms of hunter gatherer or even some of the stateless sedentary agricultural societies right so he sees differences across the infrastructure and the superstructure and for him therefore we can't say that the economic is the infrastructure with stateless societies this is a very contrary to basic marxist understandings of political economy Right. And and I think that Baudrillard is trying to this is why he he tells us at the end of the chapter to look at society against the state. What does he say? He quotes that interesting um, report from Surfy, which Watery was a founding member. And we are told who writes this report, but it's very fascinating, right? Because it's the term that Grant has here is auto slaughter, but I guess it's automobile Deaths is, I mean, but I, I maybe Baudrillard is being playful, but he talks about how no matter if you get more police on the road or if you get more, if you get more strict speed limit laws or let's say, you know, policing, uh, drunk driving more, we could add that. But he, he's basically saying there's um, the rational strategy for curbing this phenomenon, prevention, speed limits, rescue services, repression is effectively negligible. They simulate the right. possibility of integrating the accident into a rational system and are therefore incapable of grasping the root of the problem, balancing a symbolic debt which founds, legitimates, and reinforces the collective dependency on the state. The rational strategies to prevent them actually accentuate the phenomenon is what yes, they argue. exactly. Which um, makes sense in the terms of civil unrest and like the repressive state response. The more you crack, to quote, to be fucking super cheesy and quote Princess Leia, the more you tighten your grip, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. <laughs> Although, uh, you know, I don't know if we can even be that sanguine at this point. Well, this is where after quoting that interesting uh, argument, he says, in this way, the struggle is everywhere opposed to a political authority. And he cites, he said, go look at society against the state. A political authority which sets all the power it can draw from its showers of gifts, the survival it maintains and the death it withdraws, above the struggle in order to stockpile and then distill it for its own ends. It's interesting because with society against the state, we see that the chiefs and the chieftains are different than the kings. They're different than the emperors, right? Because chiefs are divested they don't have power the power for the locus of power the place of power for cluster is in the society itself right the chief does not wield power he can't give commands except in very strict circumstances like uh martial you know adventures in terms of war but even then it's not something that he can will for himself to garner his own prestige if the tribe doesn't want to go to war the chief doesn't have the chief doesn't have that power. And one of the things that the chief too is uh, known for is his generosity, where he is 
the least he is the one with the least possessions in the uh in the group and is constantly finding out clever ways of getting new gifts for the society so this is where Claster talks about this riddle of a powerless power, right? Of it's our ethnocentrism that thinks that the chief is, is giving unilateral commands. Yeah. And this is why he talks about there's a difference between coercive power and non-coercive power. And this is why I think for him, the economy and the political are not the same thing it, in stateless societies, at least. Hmm. And I think that Baudrillard is trying to work with some of this. But I think that this is where, too, Leotard finds a kind of interesting confusion. And I mean that in both senses, a confusion and sense of discombobulation, but a confusion, too, of conflating two things when he talks about symbolic exchange. For Leotard, he's taking Mouse's phenomenological descriptions of gifts and counter-gifts societies, mm -hmm. and he's also mixing in Lacan's symbolic. Yeah. Right. He's, he's mixing in Lacan's symbolic, which is obviously linked to castration. I don't know if Baudrillard talks about castration in this book, but he, the, the quote that you had last time for us, right? The, the alibi for castration. Um, yeah. That was from symbolic exchange you know, and death. Okay. So our, so yes, our entrance into the symbolic as speaking subjects and the, into the world of language, which is a kind of fundamental alienation, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I think that for Leotard, this is, it's not necessarily dangerous, but it's indicative of what Baudrillard is doing and, and, it is, and is implicitly packing into the term symbolic exchange. The only critique I really have of this first chapter, why I found it, found it frustrating, is I felt like he was presupposing we were on his level with a lot of these terms. Yeah. Right? On his level about code, about death, about symbolic exchange, and he only really gives us little bits and pieces here to make us confirm what we understand. This is why I felt like I needed to go back and read, read Marx, read Claster, read more Baudrillard from the political critique of the sign. Le Leotard has a funny point when he says that symbolic exchange would also fall under political economy and therefore we don't need another political cr critique of the sign. He says, that, you know, if we keep going this r rate in 10 years, we'll have another political critique of the sign. He's obviously digging it at Baudrillard. He's kind of a gadfly. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess that at the end of the chapter, I was left wanting more. I think that, that this is why the, what's, what's their names? Or what's his name? The guy that wrote the first introduction, or they both wrote it, Mike Gain and Nicholas Gain in their introduction, Symbolic Exchange and Death Today, are very good about saying Chapter two, where we get into simulation and simulacra, is the one that is commonly cited and is the one that seems to be isolated from the rest of the book and given precedence. Yeah. Where they say that a lot of, but, but that a lot of the setup is done in chapter one. Right. So when I went into chapter one and was a little frustrated, I was thinking that I was being not set up in a negative sense, but I was being, there was small building steps built that'll pay off for the rest of the book. Do you have a quote here? Yeah. And I mean, I think this go, this covers like ground we've sort of already covered a bit, but I think, I don't know, there is a little bit of a reference to Dilla's here, but I don't know if this is the one. Theoretical production, like material production, loses its determinacy and begins to turn around itself slipping abysmally towards a reality that cannot be found, and this is where we are today. Undecidability, the era of floating theories as much as floating money. No matter what perspective they come from, the psychoanalytic included, no matter with what violence they struggle and claim to rediscover an imminence or a movement without system of reverence, Deleuze, Leotard, etc. All contemporary theories are floating and have no meaning other than to serve as signs for one another, it is pointless to insist on their coherence with some reality, whatever that might be. The system has removed every secure reference from theory as it has from any other labor power. Theory no longer has any use value. The theoretical mirror of production has also cracked. So much the better. What I mean is that the very undecidability of theory is an effect of the code. Let there be no illusions. There is no schizophrenic drift about this flotation of theories where flows pass freely over the body without organs, 
which he says, of what capital in parentheses. It merely signifies that any theory can from now on be exchanged against any other according to variable exchange rates, but without any longer being invested anywhere unless it is the mirror of their writing. This is supposed to be the gotcha quote. <laughs> I remember this. I guess a few things I would say about this. The mirror for Baudrillard is out there in the writing. For someone like Proust, when he's describing his novel, his seven fucking novels, but one novel, his search of lost time, he's talking about it productively as a machine. And he uses the metaphor of the mirror and says that the book, instead of, uh, instead of us reading into the book, the book reads into us. And his point being like, it's productive. It's meant to do something and have effects. And, and, if, and if you don't, if it doesn't work for you, then find it somewhere else because it's there. Now, I think for like the and Guattari, they say the same thing. It's not really about what a what a book says and means. It's a, it's right. effects. What, that what effects be, does it produce in the world? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's where Baudrillard wants to say that both on the one hand that the mirror is cracked, which I think is one metaphor, but then on the other hand, it's it's nothing but mirrors, cracked or not mirrors of writing and i don't i don't know i don't i don't again that gets us into a kind of what leotard one of the one of the things that he's constantly critiquing throughout libidinal economy mm -hmm. and why i don't really feel like he fits this this answer for baudrillard is is the theological mythological underpinnings of theory that in the end are nihilistic and i don't know if baudrillard doesn't just reinforce that feeling Right, that this that 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 this is a kind of nihilistic critique. Yeah, that would obviously subsume itself, mm -hmm. and so that's where I don't think you can stop at that. This playful polemic of well, it's just this infinite mirror stage of writings. You can it's infinite substitutability of theories. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that's the point. I don't think it's it's like you're. You know, you're getting a little surplus value by quoting Deleuze over here and Leotard over there, right? Like the stuff that you and I have been trying to do in our discussions of not just the Freudian text, but obviously the discussion of, of Leotard, libidinal economy is, and Leotard's challenge to us is the point is not to nail down what, what the text argument is, what the theory is, what right. the critique is, yeah. you know, it's... I hate to say what reaction does it produce, but yeah, what reaction does it produce? What lines of flight right. are you drawing from? What concepts does it help formulate or like accelerate, not accelerate, but just produce, producing thought, producing concepts, et cetera? Yeah. I, I but is that, right. but doesn't that at the end, like, isn't producing more concepts, more code, more thought, just more sign value to kind of it, fill up the system with signs Ad, ad infinitum, right? I, I'm, Especially I'm, when it comes to um, something like the internet. Well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to bring back the matrix here and say that it seems as though the Deleu Deleuze, Guattari, Leotard are being characterized as steak here. And Baudrillard's like, I'm just giving you the gruel of the meal, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, I, I'm just giving you the, the fucking oat soup. And I don't know if I'd buy that. Or I don't even know if he would say, oh, the gruel is a part of the code to blah, 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 whatever. Right? Because in, in the Matrix, it's very clear if you're in or out. Whereas yeah. with Baudrillard, and I, especially Leotard, I think that that distinction would be merely another effect of representativity. Representationalization is a word that I think <laughs> talks about Baudrillard. It's a mouthful. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, and, and so with, I can't tell yet if Baudrillard is saying like, I'm giving you the gruel. I'm giving you the real as it is, because because I think that, that for him that that would get us back into a question of equivalence, right? That yes. his writing right. is about equivalent. there being a, about that. Well, that's what's the weird thing too. Like you said, it's like this. He's got this weird vacillation for the lost object. Yeah, he tries to play both sides of the aisle a little bit. Yeah, in terms of lost object, basically. I think Leotard tries to theorize how one has to do that, and one is Ooh, always doing that. Nice. I mean, that's we great. we it's but it's it's the thing. Like, I, I think Baudrillard he doesn't maybe not say it in this chapter. I assume he says it in the book somewhere, but he does say it in 
it's either Requiem for the Media or some other essay in the, the For the Critique of the Political Economy of the Side, where he, he says um, basically that Leotard saying we have to use representation as a me means of critiquing it, there's this sense in which we have to use a code against itself, right? And we have to, we have to be aware that we're doing this. Yeah. And I think that that's why for him, symbolic exchange is, is fundamental because it is the only thing that gives an out, that gives this yeah. way of turning the code back against right. itself. Yeah, because he, um, he says here that you can't, maybe it's later on in the book, but one of the big points is can't take on capitalism at the level of the real. It has to be at the symbolic. Yeah, and I think that for... To lose and watch from the point of view of the machine unconscious, it's not about the symbolic or the imaginary. Yeah. Right. And in fact, for them, this is why the stakes of the real uh, and this, the question of metaphor and autonomy are so mm -hmm. important. Yeah. This is why this attack on substitutability itself is put in question and why the we'll get into we'll get into that it's at a certain point we'll have to come back to that and, and and see and this is also why you know for for them their understanding of code is different right because for yeah, them yeah, the yeah. primitive territorial machine codes the flows yeah i see i think um, they're i think code yeah code and virtual code and the virtual are different for both I think versus so. Deleuze and Guattari as well and i think that that the way that Leotard is trying to point out that Baudrillard is using the symbolic in a very interesting way right trying to trying to splice lacan and mouse trying to splice the gift economy the gift right the, the notion the notion of because you know w with the gift there is no exchange in in the terms of the gift economy you give not so that you there is no equivalent to be given back well we talked about that too when it came to liberal economy and i forget the was it the trading of women remember do you remember that whole line of thinking about there's no there's nothing that's of equivalent value to like i guess the daughter or whomever of the chieftain right. or whatever like and trading with a different tribe the exchange of i guess yes. reproductive capacity with a different tribe etc Right, you can't, and it being about that debt. So that sort of that's maybe that's a little bit of congruence as far as Leotard goes. Right, I think this is why w the way I understand Baudrillard's notion of ambivalence is precisely when one receives a gift in mm -hmm. the gift economy, it's ambivalent because obviously you are being given something that, whether it be useful or beautiful, uh, or even can be bartered and traded elsewhere outside of that in an exchange economy one is being given something that can be put into circulation or can be gotten it gives you something however it's supposed to enrich you your life but you are forced to give back or prestige is is given back and conferred to the one who gives right does that make yeah. sense like yeah. that's that's where the notion of prestation comes because it is about a kind of obligation. Yes, there's, I, yeah. Whereby there's the, like, counter, the counter gift isn't an equivalent. Right. It isn't like I'm yes. making up for it, yes, but yes. and yet at the same time, I put is. in this relation. Yeah, it is and it isn't. It isn't. That's the ambivalence. Yeah, yeah. That's the right. ambivalence. Good call, um, okay, got it. You know, you, you're put in this position whereby you are, you have to counter gift to get back that yes. prestige. Or right. To, or, or so the the equivalence and they're not equivalents, the non equivalence of prestiges and their fluctuations, mm -hmm. that's where the gift and counter gift is yes. interesting. And that's, I think, where Baudrillard is trying to argue that the symbolic exchange, which really, I mean, exchange is in, even the right word, right? Because it, it isn't about, there isn't an equivalence in it. You're not giving a gift and getting a gift back. The gift, you're getting back isn't a gift it's it's prestige it's its own accumulative sphere interesting so yeah it's breaking that equivalency the equivalency of all and in that sense it being a more real in the baudrillardian sense though here the gift stuff i don't know the gift stuff is less to me like this is kind of where it's a little bit i'm not so thrilled with the book or his position because the gift economy has its own very strict symbolic regulations. <laughs>
within those cultures. It's not right. It's a very regimented process of obligations, et cetera. So it's in a sense, I don't know how much of an improvement that is over capitalist social relations, except for the fact that it doesn't flatten everything out, right? And it accepts difference. It doesn't try to provide this universability of exchange. So perhaps that's where the revolution is, is the non-equivalence, the unique, the difference. And that gets to kind of the, you know, a little bit of Nietzsche, Deleuze with a difference in repetition, which also I just, too, I guess, an infinite depth. Yeah. just want to point out too, what's kind of cool here is that really the ground, the, the text that all these books are, they're all centering around the same kind of locus of thought, largely speaking. Obviously, Baudrillard is innovating by bringing in Mouse as opposed to someone like Levi Strauss or, or what have you. But, yeah, you know, Death Drive with, from Freud being like a primary text, which we've obviously covered and having such centrality to all three books, Anti-Oedipus, Little Blue Economy, and Symbolic Exchange and Death. Obviously, Nietzsche, that influence is certainly within Baudrillard, especially as we move forward into his, his work, you'll see that it becomes this more aphoristic essay type style of writing. For example, I think in the 80s, I believe it's 84, 82, somewhere in there, he writes this very, one of his more lauded works was called Fatal Strategies where he takes this sort of praxis of death, et cetera. That's like, that's the whole idea behind, okay, the, our options are very limited. These are fatal strategies that one can attempt. Within that book, like I said, there's no, there's no organizational structure. It's just this whole kind of, I mean, he, he doesn't write aphoristically quite, but you know, it's not the systematic approach. It's not the essay form. It's not the systematic approach here let's say at least, and it gets more into the sort of polemical, theory fictional kind of milieu. But I just thought that was interesting. I really, I wanted to ask you actually, just personally what your experience of the book was, or at least this chapter and so far, because one thing I was thinking that was sort of interesting here, relative to these three books, you and I as well, and like our experience with them is, it's funny because there's You've read Anti-Oedipus before. I have not. Neither of us had read Libidinal Economy, right? Right. I don't think you had read it. No. And then I've read Symbolic Exchange and Death, but you hadn't. So it's kind of funny that we get this whole... The non-equivalence, the asymmetry. <laughs> yeah, the right. asymmetry of it is... But the symmetry, the asymmetry, but the symmetry too. Of, it's kind of a neat little like folding or... Yeah. I don't know, a quilting point maybe is a good way yeah. to, to elaborate upon it. I mean, I think that that's why we are using the libidinal economy as, as our common ground sometimes. Yeah, for, exactly. But it is nice because, you know, I feel like with what I get out of reading Anti-Oedipus with you is that, you know, I get to try to help you along in certain places where I feel confident, but at the same right. time, you're asking some questions and seeing things that, that I may not see. It's yeah. the same thing with the symbolic exchange and death where I'm asking questions that yeah, may yeah, not yeah. have occurred to you while you're also Certainly. able to, right. to guide me and help help, yeah. help keep me on track. You know, I would say that with, with this first chapter, my response to it, I was consistently thinking of the other two authors, which is why I said that it's obvious that Baudrillard is acknowledging this kind of debt you, that he's trying did, to repay. You um, did also, I think specifically, you did reference fr your frustration with the book. Or with the I chapter, was, at least. I think that I was frustrated with. Was it the, that thing of you weren't sure what he was? You said he kind of had this willy nilly fly by the seat of his pants approach to the terminology, whereas Guattari, for example, would not, he would have a much more systematic approach as, as far as terms go, et cetera. It, with, with Deleuze and Guattari, the frustration is that. Even if they define certain yeah. oh, yeah. terms, right. <laughs> they are they are creating these concepts out of this necessity. Yeah. This necessity to break away from certain overdetermined conceptualizations that yes. classically would hold. And so right. you do have, and many of the terms are coming from poets and novelists. So you do have a lot thrown at you at once. Right. Um, you can start to see by chapter two, their polemic against psychoanalysis will lead them to refine the terms that they, they put forth in chapter one. And then in chapter three, it's almost like they start all the way over and do this anthropological 
approach that really does start to be concrete by the time you get to chapter four, you know, you are working directly with Marx a lot more or directly with historical events a lot more. I think my, my only frustration with Baudrillard is this notion of, well, everybody knows what political economy is and yada, yada, that's yep. in the past. All this shit's in the past, but you know, he's still, he's, he's still talking about it. And it's not clear when he, for example, like when he says symbolic exchange, yeah, it's right. not directly clear that. Yeah, what the fuck is he talking um, about? And so I think that that was the only thing that I was frustrated with was like, okay, I need this, I need to look at these other books like the mirror of production, yeah. uh, the consumer society, like the, the essays that I mentioned for a critique of the political economy, the science, which are all previous works just right. for the audience, that, just so that, to orient them, I think. Cause he's yeah, yeah. really, he's coming, like we said, from that sort of Barthian semio semiotic background, in addition to kind of really, I don't know if, I think Bourdieu is typically considered sort of a sociologist. Yeah. He's a, he's a sociologist. He kind of straddles this weird and Baudrillard as well. He's, you know, he's not really talked about in sociology, sociology, although I think that is more so technically what his, what he would be, his area of expertise or so. Right. Yeah. I mean, Bourdieu is, is doing work on, you know, different symbolic forms of prestige and power uh, in, in different classes and, and the work of art in, in the academy. And obviously Lefebvre is, is doing a you know, a critique of everyday life, right? That's one of the things that he's most famous for, which is why Baudrillard's first book, The System of Objects, you know, he's got this, he's got these beautiful semiological interpretations and critiques of, you know, lighting and, you know, window panes and window shades and objects throughout the house, architecture. And, yeah, that'll be interesting uh, fodder to, that'll be interesting to draw upon when we hit chapter, the chapter, the chapter on fashion, I think will be, that can really help us there. Yeah, and he, he's got, he's got a, um, yeah, chapter three, fashion or the enchanting spectacle of the code. He talks about fashion in the system of objects. He talks about fashion in one of his essays and for critique of the political economy of the sign. What's it called? The essay is called Design and Environment. And that's kind of, but he's also got an essay on the art auction, which is cool. Yeah. I'm sure he could have written about the. Um, well, he has a later the book, chicken. The Conspiracy of Art. Well, there you go. And he's, he could have written an essay about the, the Among Us chicken nugget, <laughs> uh, the art auction for that. But yeah, so I guess that that, would, that that was why reading the earlier stuff and the guys introducing the game, I, yeah, I assume yeah. they're, they're the sociologists. They were, they were talking about Max Weber, Weber, and his relation to, you know, this question of enchantment, this question of rationalization in society and how Baudrillard draws from that. I thought that was helpful. You know, who's interesting too, uh, you mentioned Weber and that just made me think about Durkheim. They mentioned Durkheim. Who Durkheim uh, is, I, so I have an undergrad. Baudrillard mentions Durkheim too. Yeah. I have an undergrad. One of my undergrads was in uh, sociology. I was like Durkheim, particularly his theory of deviance, because it was this notion that deviance was a function. He had this functionalist approach to deviance that deviance would always be present because it serves a social function and that deviance would simply be redefined by different cultures at throughout time and was never this static thing. It was always within the system of signs, et cetera, right? Yeah. Which makes perfect sense as to why Baudrillard would enjoy that or bring him in, right? It's the same sort of process that's occurring it's recognizing sort of that it's a really it's a like structural linguistic approach almost from Durkheim right yeah so I guess that but that's getting a little bit far afield sorry no 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 I guess that 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 was my only frustration was seeming that Baudrillard was assuming the reader's familiarity okay. with his work and I don't necessarily fault him for that but it did make me uh, want to do some research and so like I know that when we go to the next chapter, because of its because it's famous, because it already resonates with his most famous book, this question of simulation, I think we will get deeper into what he's doing and what he's uh, hoping to achieve with the book. Yeah, he goes um, into the met metaphysics of the code, which I think will be particularly interesting. I don't recall. This too, there's another section titled Cool Killer or the Insurrection of Signs, which sounds compelling. So yeah, so two goes. what I'm interested in is, and I guess it's just keeping some of this 
it's getting deeper in the work and um and i one thing that i want to as we kind of wrap up one thing that i find fascinating is in 72 Deleuze and Guattari say that the chief anthropological work for analyzing society today shouldn't be mouse's book on the gift which obviously is central for baudrillard right they say they say it should be the genealogy of morals <laughs> at least and, and and specifically the second essay that Nietzsche wrote in that volume, which I think that Asset Horizon did a podcast on recently. So if you're interested in that, go track that down. Hopefully yeah, they right. hopefully they cite uh, anti Oedipus and, <laughs> and Deleuze and Guattari's because they they say at least it should be. At least the, the key text should be genealogy of morals and not Mouse's the gift. So just just throwing that out there for um, as we get deeper into anti Oedipus. Was there was there any other uh, any other juicy juicy quotes? Yeah, I had initially decided not to read this, but and I read the other Deleuze and Guattari kind of polemic. I want to read this one just maybe because it kind of condenses a lot of what we've discussed in the episode, and then we can kind of commence with the denouement sort of here. But we also discover this in the flotation of all the categories of political economy once they lose their gold reference: labor, power, and, and social production labor and non-labor, labor and capital become commutable. All logic has dissolved, and we discover this in the flotation of all the categories of consciousness where the mental equivalent of the gold standard, the subject, has been lost. There are no more authorities to which to refer, under whose jurisdiction producers could exchange their values in accordance with controlled equivalents. The end of the gold standard. There are no more authorities to which to refer, under whose aegis, a subject could exchange objects dialectically or exchange their determinations around a stable identity in accordance with definite rules. The end of the conscious subject, we are tempted to say that this is the reign of the unconscious, which is, I think is an interesting point. Yeah, that's super interesting. The logical consequence of this is if the conscious subject is the mental equivalent of the gold standard, then the unconscious is the mental equivalence of a speculative currency and hot money. Today, individuals disinvested as subjects and robbed of their fixed relations are drifting in relation to one another into an incessant mode of transferential fluctuations, flows, connections, disconnections, transference, countertransference. Society as a whole could easily be described in terms of the Deleuzean unconscious or of monetary mechanics, or indeed in the Reismanian terms of other directedness, which is already unfortunately an Anglo-Saxon and therefore barely schizophrenic terms, the flotation of identities. Why privilege the unconscious here, even if it is orphan and schizophrenic? The unconscious is that mental structure contemporaneous with the most radical current phase of dominant exchange. It is contemporaneous with the structural revolution of value. I found this... One part of this was confusing, which which is that he equates the unconscious with hot money or with with the hot. Yeah. So here we're referencing. You know, this is he's definitely influenced by McLuhan and the yeah, concept yeah. of the hot and the cool mediums as they apply to media, television, radio, etc. Um, I feel like television is a hot medium, for example, yes. versus radio is a cool, and I I'm pretty sure that's what McLuhan would say. My problem was, he says, any quote-unquote message keeps us in the hot. We are the cool area when the medium becomes the message, right? And his thing about hot was that it still retains a referent, and it's the cool that is the floating. Mm -hmm. Here he seems to be conflating the hot and the cool with the unconscious. Yeah. Because I think that the question about the unconscious and messages is is radically it's like a fucking ticking time bomb because it, it because it the question of of the unconscious and its messages the notion of message would be very diverse right if we focus on McLuhan and this way of reading it or on information theory or on linguistics you know he does you know, have a kind of Deleuzean approach to that too which i think is interesting in the sense of like the structural the structural edifice of the media right signifying as well not just the content which is what you you mentioned earlier 
when Deleuze and Guattari are talking about the writing, et cetera, right, is that they're concerned with the effects it has in the world, not with the writing specifically. So it has a sort of same big sort of dovetail there, right? Yeah. And so if the unconscious is hot, if it is therefore reduced to reference and messages, I think that that's completely different than on the one hand, that's completely different than the machinic unconscious, right? Yeah, as okay. productive. Interesting. And See, I thought the opposite. See, I thought it was like a perfect one, uh, not a perfect one-to-one, but I, I think of desiring, pr- I associate desiring production with the hot unconscious. A lack would be a cold, a cool unconscious. Well, but he, but his, his, his way of doing it is that the, is that the hot is, is referent and has in, in his messages, whereas cool is floating, right? Okay. Or it's free floating. This is why I was a little bit confused. Yeah. Okay. But, but, but again, you know, even for someone like Lacan, if we're, talking about where he gets the symbolic and symbolic exchange from. I mean, even in someone like Lacan, the subject is not the conscious subject of philosophy, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's, you know, the unconscious is speaking through me or whatever, right? But, you know, it's, it's I guess that's, that was the thing where I, I, I did feel like in some of these usage of terms from Freud, from not necessarily Marx, which he seems pretty, pretty good on, but from Freud, from Lacan, stuff like this, or, or like here McLuhan, I was a little bit, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that the unconscious can be reduced to, to its messages. I mean, one of the reasons being, if you look at like dream formation, unless you reduce its message down to the fulfillment of a wish, which I don't even know would be a message, could right. be something that the analyst might decode. Yeah. But at least in the mechanisms of the transformations and what's going on and the formation of the dreams, it's more like a rebus as Freud describes it. Right. And, right. and it's that, that I think is where to say that it's a message is questionable because now signifiers and signifieds are, they are both in free flux, but at the same time, signifiers are acting as signifiers. Right. And I don't think that that's really what Baudrillard is talking about because what he's talking about is the free floating of signifiers with respect to each other. Yeah. And I think that that's where, if everything is reduced then to word presentations, I think that you lose the schizophrenic aspect of things being treated as words or demetaphorization or the schizophrenization that. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, so that's that, where that's where Deleuze and Guattari see the liberatory element of the schizophrenic. Whether it's liberatory right? or, or not, like, it's it's at least it's well, okay. It has that positive it's productive. Uh, principle. Yeah. But it has that, that be positive, the better way. Yeah. It has that positive principle of resisting neuroticization. Yeah. Right. And so yeah, if that's what you mean by liberatory, then Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's yeah, I think that sort of productive would be the because that sort of is gesturing towards a sort of positive view without quite being <clears throat> fully to it. Yeah, and I guess that the, this is the thing, like when Freud is attacking the philosophers for reducing mental the mental to the conscious i don't think he's i don't think there's an equivalent with saying that the that the conscious subject of philosophy is is the gold standard mm-hmm. i think that that's that's strange to me because for Deleuze and Guattari and i think for Freud too it's not like the unconscious and its quote unquote discovery in psychoanalysis was never there until the 19th century Right. I mean, I, I think that it's this question of the unconscious has always been operative. And yeah. I think the ancients have known that. Right. And um, yeah, this is where I disagree with Baudrillard too. Like, I think that he, about the unconscious being operative for a far longer period in terms of human culture or civilization. That's a good point to bring up. Well, it's interesting. Okay. So if the conscious is the gold standard, the unconscious is the mental equivalent of speculative. Currency. I have a take on this, but yeah, I'll let you go, go first. No, I mean, the, my, my thing was just that. We don't have a gold standard anymore, but we still right. have consciousness. So it's it's a weird well, it's a weird metaphor. I disagree. For me, what I take this as the subject with the fixed identity that is sort of in the I guess in the popular imagination or like the sort of positivist enlightenment tradition, right? That posits a stable identity for the subject, and all of Western civilization being founded upon the notion of the stable subject who the mechanistic subject versus now in the postmodern 
you know, Baudrillard would probably say the proliferation of identity becomes paralyzing in a sense. The, the because, floating of identity, the, the slipperiness. Yeah, because you just are sort of bouncing around between reference or like sign signif you know, there's the sort of play of right, the right. signs, et cetera, but there's no stable identity for one to have. And capitalism proliferates these identities so that you are that let's see and that's where I but yet he's saying again on contrary to the Deleuzean unconscious, which see I thought that felt very in line with Deleuze and Guattari, you know, because they're criticizing the subject as well. And they're saying, you know, a better way to conceive of this is what the components of subjectification. And so I think that that's sort of what Baudrillard is arguing here, or he's sort of gnawing on the same issue in a different yeah. framework. It's interesting. And that's why the appeal of fascism is so strong, because that gives you then, I guess that absolves, I don't know, fascism seems like a way of warding off castration. And it wards off the fluctuation of identities. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah precisely, precisely. Because I know, I know clearly what I am and what I'm supposed to do. What group I belong to. Right. So there's no, it's the floating, it's the indeterminate. But what does he say? Does, does he say indeterminate? Doesn't he give a different he, word for he, the no, same? Well, I mean, his main critique is. Okay, so he says, yeah, it's, there's, there's indeterminacy of the, he kind of describes the current mode of capitalism as indeterminacy being the rule part of a ruling logic yes yeah right and so as that becomes more as that evolves that's why you see identity politics becoming so prevalent right now is because there there's the sort of there's the nausea of free-floating identity of being of being a fucking component of subject of subjectification or whatever being an assemblage is dizzying we're not the whole consciousness hasn't the unconscious hasn't caught up to this new demand this again is you're exactly right to talk about the indeterminacy and the the free floating of identity and why you have a rise and a, a backlash of not just identity politics but of um fundamentalisms right, right? because they are and, and you know i'm not making an equivalence between fundamentalism and fascism but fascism is a form of fundamentalism a radical form but it's still a type of anchoring or what Lacan might call a quilting point, right, for for identities, for signifiers and signifiers. Which is itself. Stick, <laughs> right. And yeah. so yeah, so like the rise of fundamentalisms and neo fascisms are are part of that attack against indeterminacy. Um, well or I mean what Deleuze and Guattari are gonna say is that it's the decoding of flows that are being warded off, right? Mm -hmm. Because the for Deleuze and Guattari, if capitalism haunts primitive societies, it's as like this negative image of the decoding of flows. That mm -hmm. is, and so yeah, I mean maybe that's partly what Baudrillard is getting to with this question of the unconscious as mental equivalent, and it's ironic that he's searching for an equivalent, right? Because yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. His, right. But this there mental equivalent of, <laughs> of speculative currency, I think that that as a stand-in for this question of capital and abstract, the abstract flows of money as a part of this whole decoding axiomatic, then yeah, I think, I think that here, when Deleuze is brought up in terms of the Deleuzean unconscious, which I think is just you know, a throwaway, but his, the, the schizo unconscious, whatever, I think that here Baudrillard is actually close yeah. to Deleuze and, and, and in some agreement. Yeah, I kind of thought so too. I want to reread. There's one little section that, and I'll then I'll kind of shut up. But I thought this really was the one. This is the section where I think he really just nails our moment today. Individuals disinvested as subjects and robbed of their fixed relations are drifting in <coughs> relation to one another into an incessant mode of transferential fluctuations, flows, connections, disconnections, transference, countertransference. And I think if you look at society today, there it is. I mean, that's absolutely what's happening. Yeah, I tried to remember what Leotard says in Libidal Economy, but he, he almost anticipates this by kind of saying, like, who doesn't know or who, or maybe his main point being, like, how could it not have always been this question of transferential exchanges? And I think that maybe for Baudrillard, with the preponderance of the code, which is what he's arguing for, and with this this hot era or this this free floating era, these transferential fluctuations are much more dynamic. Yes, and not 
not necessarily as stable. Right. Yes. There's because I think what comes into play here is simulation and the simulacra, the procession of them. Right. Because then those, all that becomes wrapped up in just this miasma of exchange of signs that and their general equivalency, <clears throat> which really doesn't just a circle circular. Right. It doesn't ever get back. It doesn't break. There are no lines of flight, even potential lines of flight. It's all foreclosed on because even if you escape one layer of simulacrum, there's another and then another perhaps. And then like now, I might even, using Baudrillard's schema for procession of simulacra, we would be in, I don't know, a fifth or sixth stage simula simulation at this point. Yeah, he, he, he points out in the preface that, right, we are in third or fourth order and I, I, I suppose, but it's interesting for Baudrillard, right? Each time you go up higher in the orders, you are able then to generalize and, and encompass the lower order, which is why he thinks that political economy being outmoded, we now mm -hmm. are in the structural mode of value rather than this equivalent one, right? So, you know, he is trying to say there is some way forward theoretically yeah. Even if it looks pretty fucking bleak. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I think that's maybe where we can we can kind of Yeah, yeah. End. Uh, yeah. No, I think that's a good that's a good point to stop. But yeah, this will be the Machinic Unconscious Happy Hour with Cooper Cherry and Taylor Atkins signing off for the week. Of negativity and singularity. Including the ultimate form of singularity, which is unconscious. <laughs> This is the typical violence of information. It's violent because what happens there is a murder of the real, the vanishing point of reality. Let's not have a misunderstanding here. Lobotomized people, as in the block work orange.